All right, looks like we're recording, so that's great. But I can't share my screen. If I click the screen share button, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Hey, there we go. All right. Now, let me just take one second to make sure I have this set up. So if I need to see any messages or anything similar, I can make that happen. Um, I don't know if that's going to work. Hang on. All right, there is no way for me to do that, apparently. <laughs> um, so if there is a message in the chat that I need to respond to or anything like that, please just just chime in and, and cut me off. Or if you need me to click a button or do something, just just say so, because I have if I am sharing my screen, I have no ability to uh, to see that stuff. But anyway, we will we will get started. So thanks for tuning in to designing a buffer considerations and plant recommendations. Hang on one sec, I'm sorry, I'm having a minor issue with the screen share. It keeps wanting to turn off, there we go. Okay, um, considerations and plant recommendations. We will get rolling. So riparian forest buffers can take on a lot of different forms. Of course, we always want to be planting trees and shrubs in that immediate riparian area. And again, riparian meaning that area immediately adjacent to the stream bank, the first, 15 feet are super critical, but then all the way out to 300 feet is what is considered the riparian area. But everyone's buffer, every buffer out there that is naturally occurring can take kind of like a different look or take on different aspects. And what is most important when designing your buffer as a landowner is your unique property goals. So if you are a person working with a landowner, that would be the landowner's unique property goals. So we want to think about the features of their property, what they want to have on their property, and kind of the activities they want to take pleasure in involving, involving their buffer. Some of these goals might be livestock and their needs and access. If you are designing a buffer and it's on a farm where the farmer is raising any kind of livestock, cattle, sheep, you name it, those all have different considerations. Um, nearby crops will also be something to keep in mind. Are they trying to grow something there? We wanna keep um, the buffer sort of like scaled back right along the crop edge so they're not shading anything out that might need a lot of sun. We wanna bring in pollinators by planting things in the buffer that can attract pollinators. Maybe the landowner is very into hunting. We worked with a landowner that I mentioned during the first webinar and one of his primary goals for his forest buffer was to increase hunting opportunities on his property for him and his sons. Maybe the landowner is very interested in fishing. They want to attract some trout to their stream that they know there's trout in the water should otherwise bring them back or, or any other kind of fish. Perhaps they're into bird watching. We can design a buffer specifically for bird watching. For pollinators, as I mentioned, other wildlife, Maybe just for aesthetics, you wanna plant a lot of flowering trees, shade to have a place to have picnics or recreate outdoors. Maybe they really want a privacy screen if it's a traveled waterway or if they have neighbors um, on the other side of that stream to build in some, some natural privacy from, from others. Or maybe it's all about protecting their legacy to make sure they're doing the best they can for that stream and for that property or, or other goals. A landowner might have other completely unique goals that need to be taken consider into consideration as well. So the best thing you can do when you are starting out designing a buffer is really think about those goals. Have conversations with the landowner or think have conversations with yourself. Think about what's important, write it down, go through all of these things, ask them about this list of stuff or ask yourself about this list of stuff. What is most important to you? And that will help inform all of the rest of the process. Other things other than your goals, once you have those all outlined, your goals for what you want the buffer to do and be to you, that's when you really wanna start looking at the land and understanding what you have. One thing to consider is soil and wetness. This is really important because we wanna make sure we're planting the right tree in the right place and giving it the right care in order for our buffer to succeed. 
different trees grow in different environments. Not all trees like their roots to be wet. Some trees absolutely need their roots to be wet to be happy. So we wanna look at sort of where, where is the soil wet? Where is it, if we're digging to plant trees, are your hands getting muddy like in this picture or are they really dry, is it very rocky soil? Um, certain trees can tolerate a really wide range of conditions and others cannot. So if we're not really sure about the property or it has a lot of mixed stuff going on, sometimes it has standing water, sometimes it's very dry, we're gonna look at those trees with a wide range of tolerance. So knowing your land is important, walking where you wanna plant the buffer is important, visiting that area in multiple seasons is important. Um, even consider soil testing. There's a link here. Um, you can just Google Penn State soil testing. Penn State is one of many places that offers a low cost soil test. Farmers frequently use the soil testing method um, to understand how to fertilize their crops and their fields, but it can also be really informative if you wanted to soil test that area where you're going to plant in determining what trees are going to do well in your buffer. It is by no means a requirement. You can absolutely plant a very successful buffer without doing a soil test. It's just a tool in the toolbox if you really wanna drill down and uh, have a full comprehensive knowledge of the area when you're designing that buffer. Something else to consider is what's already growing nearby. Are the trees growing there, trees that really like wet conditions? If so, you might assume, okay, the soil must be fairly, fairly wet there. Is it, are there trees that only kind of grow in dry areas? So check those things out to help inform what's going on with the soil and the site wetness as you're planning things. Another thing to consider is width. How wide do you want your buffer to be? Generally, from an ecological standpoint, the wider the buffer, the better. But we know that doesn't work for every single landowner that's willing to plant a buffer. Varying widths is okay. We want, but it doesn't have to be the same width everywhere. It doesn't have to be a consistent 50 feet every area and every acre that you're planting. Um, we can design it so there are accommodations for pinch points. So that if there's a farm lane or a building or the landowner really wants a view of the water in a certain place, we can design those varying widths throughout the buffer to kind of take all of that into consideration. You can see from the aerial photograph here, this buffer that's planted in these farm fields is wider in some places. Uh, like here, it's pretty wide. Where here, it's kind of narrow to accommodate those fields. Um, there's a gap here where some kind of road goes through it. It's pretty narrow here. So we can design our buffers to have those varying widths to make sure they're meeting the landowner needs. We might wanna consider going wider in areas of concentrated flow path if possible. What is a concentrated flow path? A concentrated flow path is an area that's not necessarily a spring or a stream or a river, but maybe it has a spring seep. Maybe it's just a low lying area in the ground where a lot of the water tends to flow there on its way to the stream. So if we have an area that has one of those kind of dips or moist areas or spring seeps going on, we really kind of wanna buffer that wider to take that into consideration because otherwise if that area isn't buffered where the water is flowing through, it's gonna have a higher concentration of pollution that'll be harder for the buffer to filter out before that water gets into the stream. There have been studies that say that at least 50 foot wide of a buffer produces the best benefits. Um, up to hundred feet has increasing benefits. Beyond that, the benefits don't necessarily increase, but we can, with most funding opportunities in Pennsylvania, plant out to 300 feet. And you're always going to do the most good the wider you plant. But don't feel like you are required to do that. We'll take much narrower widths because they still have a lot of good they can do for those streams. Many funding programs, if you are seeking outside funding for your buffer, do require a minimum of a 35 foot width. Some of that means 35 foot width everywhere, depending on the program you're going through. Um, some of it means an average of a 35 foot width. So maybe you have it's 100 feet somewhere, but 15 feet someplace else. And in the end, it balances out to 35 feet. So do take that into consideration if you are seeking um, different funding sources for your buffer. If you have some things that are going to impact what width you can do, it might impact the kind of funding programs you're eligible for. Establish and maintenance is also something, establishment and maintenance, sorry, is something we wanna consider when we're designing the buffer. 
We will talk more about the details of how to care for your buffer next week during next week's webinar, but we, we do still want to think ahead as we're designing it to take some things into concern or into consideration. Specifically, mower size is really, really important when we're designing the buffer. How, if you're going to be mowing in between your rows, what, what kind of mower are you going to be using? Is a contractor coming in with a mower and they're doing the mowing? Is a farmer using farm equipment to do the mowing? Are you using your regular lawn tractor to do the mowing? We want to design the width in between the rows, so from here to here, plus in between the individual trees in the rows, so from here to here. Um, so that that mower, whatever we're planning to mow the buffer with a couple times a year, can fit in those areas well. So that you can go down the end, turn around, come back, then also mow sort of in between here. Um, the reason we plant buffers with sort of those straight lines is for mowing ease. Mowing is so important to make sure your buffer survives and thrives and does not get overtaken by invasive weeds or choked out by something like reed canary grass. So we do wanna make sure, we don't have to mow the buffer weekly like you do your yard, nothing crazy like that, but we do wanna get in there a couple times a year, mow out that competing vegetation until those trees can grow big and establish a canopy. So we're mowing for maybe, three to five years, maybe less than some buffers, maybe more in others. So designing for those mowers to get in there is super important. Typically we look at a 10 by 10 or 15 by 15 spacing or some variation of those two numbers, those fit most mowers. And that usually ends up meaning we're looking at planting between uh, 200 or so, maybe 250 trees and shrubs per acre. That is also, not a hard and fast rule. You can go a little bit less than 200 per acre. You can go more and plant super densely if you want to, but it's all about how are you going to maintain that buffer and then keeping that consideration in mind when you're talking about spacing and you're thinking about future maintenance. All right. So you're thinking about your goals, you're thinking about your property, what's there, how wet is the soil, what other trees are growing, you're thinking about how you're going to care for your buffer, you have all of that in mind and you can kind of design the general layout, and now you want to think about plants. Mostly we want to plant native. We talked a little bit about this in the first week as well, but native trees and shrub species, native plants, are going to do the most good for that stream, for your property, for the ecosystem in general. If you don't know what plants are native, you're not sure how to figure out what native plants you want to put in that buffer, this is a neat website that is designed specifically for the Chesapeake Bay area, but could also apply to the rest of Pennsylvania. It is nativeplantcenter.net. And this is the page that will come up if you go to that website. This is what it looks like. And you can search for plants based on region, plant type, sun exposure, soil texture, soil moisture. You can also look for flower color, fall color, when they bloom, when they fruit, all of that fun stuff. So it's a really cool interactive website and tool for finding native plants, including trees and shrubs to plant in your buffer. So please feel free to use this. Uh, go to this website, talk, you know, think about those things you already planned out as far as your soil test, how wet the site is, what kind of trees you're looking for, and you can put in, you know, the region that you are in and it will help you determine what are some choices that would do really well in your riparian forest buffer on your property. Why native? Um, the reason is because trees support the stream food web. So if the ultimate goal of a riparian forest buffer is to keep that stream healthy and clean up that stream, we want to support the food web with native leaves. So in the fall, of course, deciduous trees, oops, I'm skipping ahead. Deciduous trees lose their leaves. A lot of those leaves fall into the stream and those leaves decompose and that builds the whole food web out. Kind of as this picture shows, it the algae are things that grow on the leaves. Oh, this thing is like advancing by itself. I'm sorry. Um, are feeding the insects in the stream. Those insects are then feeding the fish. And if we're trying to bring fish to our stream and have a healthy stream, we want a healthy food web. And there have been studies done um, specifically by, by Stroud Water Research Center. Uh, and those studies show that the bugs in Pennsylvania streams, they do not eat the leaves or the algae that grows on the leaves of, of non-native species. They will just starve and die. They need those native species there to help and feed them and make their food web work. 
I'm going to see if I can get this thing to stop skipping ahead on me. Um, fingers crossed that works. Sorry for everybody that I'm going back and forth if it does not. All right, so what are these bugs that we're talking about that live in the stream? They are mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, along with a whole other host of insects. We won't dwell on them too much, but these three species um, are sort of like those characteristic species that can tell us whether a stream is healthy. If they have a lot of mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies living in that stream, that stream is healthy, we know we're doing a good a good thing there. You can check and see how many species like this live in the stream just by picking up rocks, flipping them over, seeing if you see anything that looked like this. Um, if you see some little bugs crawling around on those bottoms of those rocks, you know you're doing a good job. Your buffer is doing what it should be doing. If you don't, maybe you will need to add some more native trees, call your conservation district and ask what's going on, see if they can help investigate. All right, so what are some, some good riparian trees and shrubs? I have several lists throughout this presentation that we'll talk about. There are many, many trees and shrubs that are native to Pennsylvania that can do well in your forest buffer. Um, here are a few, we're gonna talk in depth about a couple of them, but these are all great choices. Silver maple, shagbark, hickory, shadbush, witch hazel um, are the ones we're gonna talk about. We also have basswood, spice bush, elderberry, pawpaw, um, black gum, American hazelnut, nine bark, winterberry holly, buttonbush, dogwoods, viburnums, river birch, box elder, American sycamore, eastern hemlock, willows. Some of these are really great species that do well right next to the stream. They have to have those wet roots. Um, willows are a great example of that. They do really, really well next to the stream. And some are a little bit more taller wood or tolerant and can be placed further back from the stream. And as you can see from this list there, the pawpaw is a great fruit bearing species. American hazelnut obviously has nuts. Um, elderberry has those, those berries, those fruits there. Um, and there are also some bigger, taller trees as well as different shrubs that can be incorporated. American sycamore is a great buffer staple. They're a real workhorse. They grow fast, they get really big. They have interesting bark, they look pretty. So we have lots of, lots of options. One of the reasons we don't talk about silver maple is a great buffer species. They can be a little messy. They drop limbs. So if you're if you're looking at a yard area, they might not be the best, but they are a nice big tree. They're 50 to 80 feet high. They have a fast growth rate. They like moist, poorly drained soil. So they're going to do really well in that riparian area right next to the stream where they can have um, wet feet. They like full sun to part shade. So if you're planting a brand new buffer, that's perfect. It's an open area now. They bloom in March, and then they are a really important spring food, nectar, and pollen resource for wildlife. So they're a great buffer species. Shagbark hickory is also another really interesting choice. They are wonderful for wildlife. They're a big tree also, 70 to 100 feet high. Um, they have a wide tolerance of different soil types from moist to dry uplands. So you could plant this really close to the stream in your buffer, or further back and still get great results. They do like a pH between 4.0 and seven. So this is something you can make sure would be good on your soil test, but that's a pretty wide range as well. Full sun to part shade again. So great for starting out with a buffer. They bloom April to May. They have nuts, they fruit in the fall. And they are really cool because they are a favored roost tree of bats. So they are called shag bark. You can see in the picture here, how they have this bark that kind of peels back and makes little crevices underneath. And bats really like to roost in there in the summer months. So if you're into wildlife and you like bats to control insects on your property or just because you're into bats, um, shag bark hickory would be a good, great choice to incorporate. Shadbush is also a really cool choice. They are a flowering tree. They flower in the springtime. They bloom March to April. Um, they're beautiful. They also have an edible fruit that will be ripe on the tree between June and August. They're a medium sized, small tree, 15 to 25 feet, up to 40 in certain areas. They also have a wide range of tolerance from moist, moist to well-drained soil and a wide pH range that they will tolerate as well. Full sun to part shade, like many of the buffer species we recommend that do really well in those early areas. So you can grow fruit on these. Um, you can eat them plain. I used to eat them when I was a kid a lot. My parents had some of these trees on their property. Um, you use them for pie filling, for smoothies. And some people also use them for food dye or a natural clothing dye. So that's pretty interesting too. If you're into sort of foraging and, and being able to use things um, from your buffer to just 
supplement food or activities that you already do. Witch hazel is also another choice. This is a shrubby small tree. They only get 10 to 20 feet high. Um, they do like that rich moist soil. So you're gonna want these right next to the stream. Same sunlight, full sun to part shade. What's really cool about witch hazel is that these trees bloom in the fall. So they get flowers from October to November and they have a sweet and spicy frag fragrance. Um, and they're pollinated by what we call winter moths, which are sort of a very specialist type of, of moth that, that um, you know, is going to focus on the only flowers that we have out there in October and November. Um, so really neat, add some really cool fall color to your buffer. Um, they also have herbal uses. Um, you might have seen in drugstores, you can buy witch hazel astringent to soothe minor skin irritations. And then you can use those cool late season flowers for some floral cuttings as well, if you'd be interested in that. So just a neat, a neat buffer species to consider. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about like specific goals for your property and what your buffer might look like if those are your goals. So if you are designing a buffer for someone who is an angler or a fisherman, some of the things you might wanna consider are abundant shade. We really wanna make sure that stream gets canopy closure and stays nice and cool because most of our fish species really need those cool streams, especially trout. And a lot of fishermen like to go after, after trout, especially other fly fishermen. We have native trout as well as stocked trout here in Pennsylvania. So we wanna make sure we get trees that produce a lot of shade. We want them to be native because we want them to feed that food web. Otherwise the trout won't be able to survive there neither will other fish. We wanna make sure we stabilize the stream bank so that we're not getting any kind of extra sediment in that stream that would ruin sort of fish nesting habitat or clog their gills. And we want to make sure that there's some stuff that might drop branches because we want some in-stream habitat and woody debris in that stream from branches falling that really helps fish have place to hide and um, improves that, that fish habitat in the stream. So some suggestions for trees you might consider if you are planting a buffer for anglers and fishermen are Eastern white pine, American sycamore, white oak, black gum, alder, hemlock. This one's tricky. We do have trouble with the hemlock woolly adelgid in Pennsylvania, which is an invasive species that are killing our native hemlock. Um, hemlock is our state tree and it is a wonderful tree for buffers and for fishing, but we wanna be careful of the, the fact that some of those trees are dying due to the woolly adelgid. So do keep that in mind if you choose that. Dogwood species are also great, as well as tulip poplar. Something that's not on here are willows for that stream bank stabilization that we talked about. These are all great species of trees to incorporate for fishermen and anglers. If you are designing a buffer specifically for hunters or wildlife watchers, some things to consider would be trees that provide winter cover and shelter nut bearing and fruit bearing species that are going to attract wildlife as a food source. Um, winter food sources, things that provide food sources, not just sort of in that growing season, but also all winter long. So the animals have something to eat during that cold season. Abundant shrubs, so they have places to hide. And then nesting habitat, depending on what kind of wildlife you want to attract, you want to consider that when you're designing the buffer. How can we, how can we ensure there's nesting habitat there? So some species to consider are American hazelnut for those nuts they produce, crab apple, they produce fruits, um, elderberry also for the fruits they produce, white pine for sort of that winter cover, white oak for the acorns, mountain laurel again for that, that cover, that thick dense shrub layer that animals can hide in, and then hemlock as well. They're, they're wonderful for animals, but again, keep in mind that woolly adelgid situation. If you would like, this is another website that is great for finding native plants, um, especially if you are considering insects and, and pollinators and you wanna attract that kind of wildlife to your property. Um, this is from the Na National Wildlife Federation. So if you go to nwf.org slash native plant finder, you can help build out your buffer. So you click on uh, this first thing here, find native plants, and it will take you, oh, yes, find native plants. It will take you to this page, uh, you can click on trees and shrubs, and it will show you different, different trees and shrubs that would be right for your region. I believe you input your zip code somewhere. 
Um, so you can click on different trees and shrubs and what will pop up is information about those trees and shrubs and then the kind of wildlife they attract. So here you can see some moths that are particularly attracted and butterflies that are particularly attracted to willows. So that's really interesting if you wanna get down into that level of choosing the trees that go into your buffer for wildlife. Some more general recommendations are available here. I realize this is small and probably hard to read. But this is a list and I can, I can send this and make it available on the website with the recordings if that's better. Um, with a bunch of different species, uh, their common name in this column, their scientific name in this column, and then what that species is good for, as well as whether you wanna plant that in the floodplain directly next to the stream or further upland in your buffer. And it's broken out, these are the trees up here and these are the shrubs down here so there's i'm not going to read you all of them that would be that would be painful there's a great list of just sort of those buffer workhorse species and in what area they grow in and what benefit they can bring to you within your buffer so here is an example planting plan just all of the the list of species that were used this is a 4.5 acre buffer site with around 200 trees being planted per acre and this is how they split it out so when you're picking your trees you don't want to go with just one tree species or even just two we really want to shoot for diversity and the reason we want to do that is because if there's a disease that comes along or a new invasive insect or fungus or anything like that that attacks a certain kind of tree then if those trees all die you're buffer doesn't die entirely. You still have other trees there that can help regenerate any of those gaps in your buffer that are caused by tree die off. An example of this would be with the ash recently. Um, you probably have all heard of the emerald ash borer. It's an insect, a beetle insect that came, I believe, um, from Asia. That's just a native insect there. It doesn't cause issues. Came over in chipping material. Here they have no predators and began attacking our ash trees several years ago and have decimated the ash population. And ash was once a great species for riparian buffers in Pennsylvania. So it has done a lot of harm. So in areas where those buffers were only ash, now we see sort of vacant stream sides. So that's why we really wanna make sure we have a good mix of species in any buffer. So the next time something like that happens, we don't have the devastation that we had with ash. So this in this buffer, you know, these have hundreds of certain trees, maybe the landowners were more, more interested in um, these things like tulip poplar, black cherry and white oak, black locust, and then a few pawpaw sprinkled in, pawpaw, some of those fruit bearing species, a couple of river birch, a few hackberry. So just a lot of, a lot of diversity, 980 total trees and all these different species with different numbers of each of those species are what we've used for this buffer. All right, another thing you might design your buffer for is income producing crops. A couple of years ago, DCNR started funding something that we call multifunctional buffers. Um, and those are buffers that produce some kind of crop that you can use otherwise. So whether that's fruit or nuts, like we talked about already, maybe it's woody florals, perhaps it's biomass. There are certain people designing buffers that have just willows in them and they're harvesting those willows for biomass or fuel. Um, Maybe people want to grow holiday wreaths or trees in their buffer that they can plant, uh, that can harvest and then replant every few years. Or perhaps you want to grow things that you're going to be able to use to get syrups, jams, and jellies, like sugar maples or that elderberry for the jam or the jelly or raspberries, blueberries, if you have the right kind of soil. Um, in multifunctional buffers, Further back from the stream, right next to the stream, we always want those native species, so they drop those leaves in there. But further back from the stream, we can also consider safe non-natives, maybe some of those orchard type species, apples, peaches, cherries, different things like that. If you are designing a buffer for those kind of, that crop, that multifunctional use for some, getting other kind of harvestable things out of your buffer, you really want to consider zones. So buffers have typically three zones, so we break them out into zone one, which is the immediate right next to the water riparian zone, zone two, which is back a little further, and then zone three, which is the, the furthest away from the stream zone. In zone one, we're talking those immediate 15 feet, at least. It could be wider, but at least those very first 15 feet, we want native species only, and we don't wanna plant stuff here that we're gonna harvest from because we don't wanna be disturbing that 
um, sensitive stream bank soil that is really prone to erosion. So from the edge of the stream out 15 feet, zone one, only native species, absolutely no harvesting here. Some zone one species are black willow, silver maple, honey locust, white pine, black gum, yellow birch, sycamore, basswood, catalpa, common elderberry. These are things that have um, a preference to have sort of those wet roots, wet feet be right next to the stream in those damp areas. Zone two, we're talking from the edge of zone one, so 15 from those 15 feet back, an additional 20 feet. So that's from 15 back to 35 feet. Um, is zone two. Here you can plant fruit and nut trees if you like for your, if you're doing a multifunctional buffer. We don't want to do mechanical harvesting in zone two. We want to do just kind of hand harvesting. We don't want to be bringing equipment into zone two, heavy equipment that could compact the soil or otherwise um, degrade that, that soil in your buffer. Zone two species that are great, um, that are Sort of native include service berry um, or, or shad bush like we talked about earlier those are also called june berries pawpaws persimmons we have a native persimmon that's that's a really great species american hazelnut crab apple black walnut common elderberry there are many other options but those are some fruit producing nut producing species for zone two that you could hand harvest um, we can also consider well-behaved non-native fruit trees or christmas trees in zone two for Christmas trees, something we don't wanna do is harvest all those trees at once. We wanna make sure that we are only harvesting a couple of trees a year and then replanting those. Then we have zone three, our final zone. This is from the edge of zone two, extending an additional 50 to 100 feet or more. Here we can plant things that we can mechanically harvest, including woody florals and forbs, biomass crops like those willows I talked about, even switchgrass, which is not a, you know, a forest, but it's a, a species that you could plant in zone two. Also the orchard type trees, Christmas tree is permitted here. Anything that you would need to mechanical harvest, you wanna reserve for zone two uh, or zone three, I mean, sorry about that. So that's what you have going on in zone three. Of course, in zone three and in some of zone two, you wanna make sure you have species that can tolerate being a little bit drier and we aren't planting those species that need to have those, the wet feet, unless you have a particularly wet property. Uh, examples, red osier dogwood, those are those fancy red twigs that you see here. They are really great in the winter. They look very beautiful. They can be used in flower arrangements. So high bush blueberry is a great example if you have the right kind of soil wild hydrangea, curly or pussy willow, witch hazel again, that might be a little tricky here because they do need to be wet. So you need to make sure you have like a, a rich wet soil in zone three. American beauty berry, um, those are these purple things. They're very cool, it's a really cool shrub. Choke berry, uh, black raspberry, lots of great examples of things you can plant in zone three of a multifunctional buffer. Some crop options are outlined here. This is a couple years old now, but just things to consider if people wanted to really financially benefit.